Welcome to Bone Pile Miniatures. This video will cover the Bone Pile Miniatures Flying Rules Supplement that we have put together for the Warhammer Fantasy Tabletop Battle Game. The original game from Games Workshop has a set of basic rules for flying models, and we have put together these rules to enhance the game experience with models that fly. We are releasing this video in conjunction with a series of videos that I have released that cover our club's house rules or how we have modified the 8th edition rules for play in our club. In a way it is our version of the 9th edition of the Warhammer Fantasy game. While still fans of the original 8th edition, we are big fans of people sharing new ways to play this fantastic game. We do feel that the 8th edition is very fun by itself and very playable. But there are a few common complaints about it that we have taken a stab at with some rules adjustments. And that is what this video series is about. We are not trying to compete with other versions of the 9th edition. And we have no beefs with Games Workshop. We are just sharing what we do under our roof for the purpose of sharing battle reports and helping to make sense of a few things we do in them that you may have never seen before. And when you read the rule books Games Workshop produced, they frequently encourage making this game your own and making things work for scenarios you want to play. So I believe efforts like this help promote the game and brand and serve to make it stronger and more appealing. And I believe they wanted us to do things like this. I have released six previous videos to this that cover our changes to the basic rules, the phase rules, the special rules or keywords, and the army detail rules, the terrain rules, and another video on miscellaneous topics like army books and magic items. And they can be found on the same playlist that this video is listed with on the Bone Pal Miniatures channel. And this video is about some specific rules we have created for flying units. We call it a supplement because it is optional to those who use our rule system. We recommend defaulting to the original 8th edition rules for the fly rule, but then recommend this to more experienced players who want to literally add another dimension to their Warhammer games. We simply call our system the Bone Pile Miniatures Mixed Rule Set. If you want to learn more about this rule set, you can look for the playlist on this channel that has all of our videos listed. You can also check out our hobby blog at bonepileminiatures.com. Look for the Rule Supplement tab and everything will be listed there. So let's get started and look into what we've done with our flying rules. So first of all, we play that models with the fly rule also come with a few other special rules or key words. These are swift stride, fast cavalry, skirmishers, vanguard, and they cannot have steadfast. And to explain the rest of the rules, I'm going to divide up the rest of the explanation into the four main phases of the game. Movement, magic, shooting, and combat, and explain how our rules apply in each phase. So starting with the movement phase. So just like normal, flying units start the game on the ground in their deployment zone. That's just for simplification and standardization. But the models can take off and land back on the ground whenever they choose to be. They can be on the ground for multiple rounds, or in the air for multiple rounds, the choice is all theirs. So then our system incorporates six different types of moves that a flying model can make. They are take off and land, fly, soar, intercept, swoop, and fly high. And I'll explain each one how they work and how to apply them in each turn phase. But each flying unit or model can only perform one of these movement options per movement phase. 
They cannot do two of them. Just like a ground unit can move or march or charge, but cannot do all three in the same phase. Fly high is the only exception, and you'll see why when I talk about it. So let's start with the takeoff and land maneuver. Since models start on the ground, they have to get themselves into the air, and that is a movement action all by itself. So is the opposite move of landing. But how far vertically do they launch into the air? We set a standard height of 10 inches. So just imagine a horizontal plane 10 inches above the battlefield where all models in the air are operating. And that's just an easy number set to keep things simple and is easy to add for the purpose of measuring distances. We have made these little marker chips to indicate if a model is in the air or on the ground. Even though they still sit on the table, they are conceptually in the air. We also indicate if they took off or landed this turn or not. That will be important to keep track of as you will see. So a model that just took off cannot march or charge this turn. They can make their normal M value move after taking off or landing, and they can perform those two moves, the taking off and the normal M move, in any order that they desire. They can do their normal move and then take off, or take off and then do their move, and likewise they can land and then move, or do their move and then land. The result is the same in the end. So it doesn't really matter about the order but they cannot take off and land in the same turn, or vice versa. That would be pointless, and so it is one or the other. The next is the fly move. This is just the model's normal move value, similar to movement on the ground. Models that fly can shoot with a movement penalty. They are allowed to join units and reform, just like ground units can. The next action is soar. This is the air version of marching. They soar at 2M, or twice their movement value. They cannot shoot, cannot reform or join, but the nice thing about air units is they don't need to worry about obstacles. And that is an important assumption that we make. That is regardless of the 10 inch planes reference to terrain pieces on the battlefield, we assume that a fly unit is never impeded by trees, buildings, hills, etc. They can soar over all of it, or fly. Maybe the only exception is a really huge fortress or tower, but those things are very rare, and the 10 inch vertical plane concept is just a simplification. If you think you find an exception to the rule that they can fly over everything, just modify the rule to make sense to that terrain piece. So that's it for SOAR. Next is Intercept. Intercept is an air-to-air -air charge, and the charge distance is 2M plus D6. So we decided to differentiate Intercept from Swoop, which is an air-to-ground charge. But a unit that performs a swoop does not land on the ground, like they do in the 8th edition. They perform like a U-shape maneuver. They start in the air, swoop down to the ground unit, then they swoop back up to the higher plane. Then the bottom or valley of the swoop is where they clash with the ground unit momentarily before they climb back up to the air. If the unit wants to fight the ground unit in multiple rounds of combat, they will have to land and then charge on the ground. But this swoop is just a one-off attack then they fly beyond the unit and will have to come back around for another swoop to make another attack from the air. So the distance is M plus D6 to the target flank and then M plus D6 beyond the unit's opposite flank. Then there's the fly high maneuver. It is a type of flea move that a fly unit can make where they fly vertically away from the battlefield and are removed from the game immediately. 
they can still sometimes flee horizontally too, but I will explain a little later how to determine whether a flying unit will flee vertically or horizontally. So the magic phase does not have any specific application for flying units. So we will skip that one and move straight on to the shooting phase. First of all we must cover shooting distances and we have provided for three different methods for determining shooting distances between air and ground units. So I have three different difficulty options and in each game the players should be consistent with the way they agree to do it between themselves and throughout the whole game and all units that shoot. First is the basic method. So with this one just measure the ground distance only between the air and the ground units. Don't worry about the vertical component to the distance and I recommend this method for beginning and young players. But of course this method will be less than the true distance but for beginners that's okay. The next method is the intermediate method. With this one you just do the same thing as the basic method. Measure the ground distance only but then add 10 to the value. 10 is the standard vertical height for all models in the game that fly. Of course an air model targeting another air model doesn't need to do this but air to ground or vice versa do need to add the 10 inches. This is the intermediate version and of course this method will produce a higher value than the true distance but that's okay. Next we have the advanced version. This method uses the triangular distance between the air and the ground units. And that's a combination of both the horizontal and the vertical distance. You can either figure this out mathematically using Pythagorean's theorem, which is a squared plus b squared equals c squared. But even easier than that might be to just have someone measure the distance while another person holds the model 10 inches above the table just simply measure it from air to ground. That would be easier than calculating it. However, the calculation may not be too hard to do. You only need to get it to the nearest inch and some people might be able to do that calculation in their head, especially after they have done it a few times. So I would recommend this triangular distance method for experienced players. And that method would provide the exact true distance between the shooters and their targets. So the basic method would be undervalued, the intermediate method would be overvalued, but then the advanced version would be the true value between the air and the ground units. But you decide between players which method you will use, and then you will need to be consistent between the players and throughout the game. In my games I use the intermediate or the advanced method, depending on whom I'm playing against which I judge by experience and skill level. But whatever method you choose, this system attempts to use the aerial distance between the air and the ground units. Some are just more accurate methods than others. So now let's look at the different states of flight in connection with the shooting phase. So with the takeoff and land maneuver, the shooter gets a plus one to hit bonus due to the predictable movements of a model performing the takeoff or land maneuver. So the model taking off or landing cannot shoot in return. Next is the fly move. Just like ground models, they are allowed to shoot with movement penalties, which is the move and shoot penalty. Models in the air have line of sight to ground units unless they are obstructed by a large target, a building, or other aerial model but they can see over other normal sized units or walls and fences and obstacles. But the model still has the cover bonus if the aerial model is more than 10 inches away in ground distance to the barrier. That's because it would be less than a 45 degree angle between the targets. And that would make the barrier cover the unit more substantially. But within the 10 inches, the aerial models are too vertical in the air for the wall or obstacle to make a difference. And that's just a gross simplification. 
but a quick way to judge it. Now the ground unit can target the aerial unit in the same line of sight rules just like with large targets and buildings and such. Now moving on to the soar status. A soaring model cannot shoot, just like a marching model on the ground cannot shoot. But due to their high velocity, soaring models also give the shooter a negative one to hit penalty if someone is shooting at them. And then for the intercept move, a model that hasn't already shot may shoot including breath weapons, immediately before an air-to-air -air attack. So this would follow initiative order, including for the charge bonuses. Shooting in this high velocity clash is much more difficult for both offensive and defensive positions. So to reflect this, there will be a negative one to hit penalty in either direction. Aerial units on the defensive get to stand and shoot per se, unless they did a takeoff move most recently. And then for the swoop maneuver, a ground unit charged by an aerial unit can do a type of stand and shoot if available, also taking the negative one to hit modifier. The charging unit from the air may also shoot or use a breath weapon if it hasn't done so this turn with a plus one to hit modifier on the ground unit. This is due to their elevation advantage. So now let's move on to the combat phase. A general concept to understand is that flying units cannot attack ground units and vice versa, except with shooting or with the swoop attack. But an air unit could be directly above a ground unit, but aren't necessarily able to be in combat. They are out of reach of each other. So that adds a new dimension to the game and makes it 3D. And that will be part of the strategy whether you decide to bring air units or not. Will your opponent bring air units to a battle? Should you counter it with your own air units? Or will you counter air units with good shooters? Or just wait for them to do their air attacks on you? This is a strategic decision each player will have to make. And that's one of the major strategic modifications to this fly rule change. This takes flying out of the autopilot mode, pardon the pun. You have to make a conscious decision about what you will do with this third dimension of the battlefield. And what do you need to do to counter its possible utility from your opponent. So let's look at the combat rules. First of all with takeoff and land. A model who made such moves has a negative one initiative for close combat. Units who have taken off cannot be charged by ground units, but they can be charged by air units. And then units that have landed on the ground are eligible for ground combat charges. Next, the fly move. A unit on the ground cannot engage with a unit in the air, except during a swoop. That's the same with a soar move. No close combat between air and ground units. Only an air unit can attack another air unit in close combat. Now on to the intercept move. This is essentially air to air close combat. And clearly this could get really complicated if we allowed it. Entire games are based upon aerial dogfights so it would be easy to go too far down the rabbit hole with this type of combat. So just to keep it simple, we allow all models in a unit the chance to attack, and this is only for air to air. Charging units get a plus one initiative. Multiple units in battle will follow all the same general principles of who can attack whom based upon contacts with flanks and such, just like with ground attacks. Air units also don't get any extra ranks for combat resolution, which correlates with them being skirmishers anyways. But flank bonuses still apply to combat resolution. Now the air-to-air -air attack is an interaction that I'm trying to simplify as much as I can, but keep it very similar to other Warhammer interactions. However, this interaction has not been play-tested as much as the other ones, 
so we're still keeping our eyes peeled for problems that may arise. So if you try this method and find some kinks, just interpret and adjust as needed to make things work. But overall we're trying to keep this interaction as similar to the ground fighting interaction as we can, just that all models can strike. We imagine that there would simply be a giant free-for-all in the sky that would be impossible to chronicle all the details of the individuals. So this is basically just a summary result of the aerial mayhem that entails the giant dogfight. But let's move on to the swoop maneuver. And to me this is going to likely be the most common combat interaction with air units. And so I tried to make this interaction extra fun. So this says that the swoop move brings flying units down into base contact with ground models momentarily. And then after the blows, the flying units continue to swoop back up into the air beyond the flank of the target. The target unit may strike back like normal, including supporting attacks, and flying units must land on the ground and then charge on the ground like normal if they wish to engage in multiple rounds of combat. Flying units gain plus one initiative, and they must swoop into an open flank on the ground unit. Like skirmishers, they bunch up together on the swoop and can only attack models in base contact. The whole unit does not attack like with the intercept attack. And for terrain, they can swoop onto rooftops without penalties. They must take dangerous terrain checks if they swoop into forests or other terrain with tall features like monuments and such. Just do what seems reasonable in those situations. Fear and terror rules also apply normally for both the attacking and the defending units. And then when calculating combat resolution, add plus one for aerial units. And if a unit has to flee because of flying unit attacks, they will flee in the direction opposite from the flank from where they were attacked by the flying unit. And then finally on to the fly high move. If a flying unit needs to flee for any reason while in the air, they must take a fly high test. So they roll a d6, and on a 4 plus, they fly high and are immediately out of the game. Similar to fleeing off the table, but vertically. If they fail the fly high test, they instead flee in the air horizontally like normal and they can be rallied in future turns like normal. But a unit that does a fly high maneuver cannot ever be rallied. They are long gone and units that flee horizontally use the swift stride rules for that. Now some further details about the wounds. A flying model suffering its final wound will hit the ground per the scatter dice from the location from where it was wounded. Ground units hit by the dead flying model takes hits per the following guide. D6 strength 10 hits from monsters. D3 strength 6 hits from monstrous beasts, monstrous cavalry, monstrous infantry, cavalry, and chariots. One strength 4 hit from infantry and war beasts. There's no test like this for swarms, and all normal saves are allowed. This represents the fact that aerial models don't just disappear when they die. They have to land somewhere. So use the scatter dice from the location where each model would have most likely died. And if many models in a unit died, then you will need to roll for each one. Each one could land in a different spot so there could be some hazards from dying aerial models. And this final wound rule not only applies to swoops, but also to anything from shooting, intercept, or other magic casualties. All models in the air have to land somewhere when they die, so each one must be resolved. And now I've played this enough times to know that usually nothing happens when they land on the ground, but once in a while, it causes a wound or two to the ground models. And it's a fun new way to mix things up and we enjoy using this rule. Flying characters with multiple wounds may need to land somewhat uncontrollably after a wound. So they roll a d6 
but not for each wound inflicted that phase. So the model might have three wounds altogether, and it doesn't really matter if it took one or two wounds, you just roll the result one time. If you roll a three plus, the model stays in the air. But on a one or a two, it fails. And if it fails, the landing location is determined with the scatter dice from the best estimated location from when the wound occurred. It must take a dangerous terrain check if it lands on anything besides open terrain. This usually will place the model alone on the ground somewhere, and then it must immediately take a panic test. And if it fails, it must flee on the ground from the source of the wound. If it would fall on a friendly unit, place it at the nearest flank plus a one inch gap between them. If it would fall on an enemy unit, place the model on the nearest open flank in base contact. And the model cannot flee in this case. It has a negative one initiative and a negative one combat resolution for falling from the air until its next turn. If it is the enemy's turn and the unit in base contact has not fought a close combat this turn, it may engage in close combat with the fallen model. And then after the combat, normal flee on the ground rules still apply. A unit not in base contact with the fallen model must wait to declare a charge at its next movement phase. And then the plus one to hit modifier when shooting at a landed or fallen model does not apply to this situation since the landing was unpredictable. So I hope that was not too confusing. But basically models with the fly rule that have more than one wound may need to make a landing to gather its wits. Of course, it may be able to take off into the air again at its next movement phase if it wants to. But at least momentarily it will sit on the ground vulnerable to ground attacks. Ground units may be able to rush it before it can take off again. And if you think about it, a unit with models with multiple wounds may get broken up and scattered across the battlefield due to these rules. And that can make things really, really interesting. Now that's all I have for the flying rules that we have written up. Some of you may be thinking, no way, and some may really like these rules. That's why we use this as a supplement. It is optional to use. But if it is just us regular players of our club, Bone Pile Miniatures, then we use these rules. And if you don't use these rules, then just default back to the 8th edition rules for flying models. And these rules are available on my BonePileMiniatures.com blog. And on the post about these rules, I have a little summary table at the bottom. This table is divided into the six different fly moves that can be made and how they apply to each of the turn phases. If you want to use these rules, then I would recommend using this table for quick reference. Then go back and read the paragraphs if you need further clarification. Of course, how to apply flying rules during the magic phase would depend upon what type of spell was used. A direct damage spell probably wouldn't have any need for any change, magic missiles would be treated like normal, augment and vex spells also wouldn't really have any changes either. So that's why the magic phase is not listed. But if something about magic does come up, try to see if the encounter is similar to a shooting or a close combat encounter. Check that first before getting too frustrated with how to apply the magic effect. If it is similar to a shooting attack, then apply those rules. If it is similar to a ground combat attack, then use those rules. But I don't anticipate there being any problems with magic phase application. So I'm just going to leave it at that. This was the Bone Pal Miniatures Flying Rules Supplement. Feel free to use them in your games or cut and paste the things you like and don't like for your own games. I'm mainly sharing these ideas for the benefit of other players. Love them or leave them as you choose. But we enjoy them and you will see us using them during our battle reports on this channel. If you haven't already, go ahead and check out some of my other videos I've produced on our club rules that we use for Warhammer Fantasy. I have a whole playlist of the main rules that we use with all the modifications that we play with. You may also be able to find other optional supplements like this one 
that you can check out in that playlist. So with that, thank you for watching this video, and we will see you at the next one, and hopefully see you at one of our battle reports. Until then, goodbye.